Now, it's tempting to think that all the stuff about the world is communicated in words, and all the stuff about us is communicated in the, the, uh, the tone of voice, the eye contact, the gesture. But actually, that's not the case. And I'm going to describe to you today two examples of the work that I've done, which shows that you can not only communicate your own ideas and your own knowledge, but you can also communicate very important things about yourself. And the two examples I'm going to give are examples of your mental abilities affected by Alzheimer's disease and about your personality affected by power. Before I do that, let's get down to some quick basics about, about language and how it communicates these, communicate these things. So it's tempting to think, as I said, of a word just as a, a vehicle for meaning. But actually, that's not the case at all. A word contains or conveys hundreds of other things, including these variables or features. Complexity, its role in a sentence, not only one meaning but many, the neighborhood of similarly meaning words. Um, and it's these two that I think uh, we'll concentrate on today because these two, the frequency of the word in the language, how often it's used, to be pictured, to have a picture drawn of it, are things that can be measured. Um, when we can measure things, scientists love these things because it means you can draw a graph of them. And when you can draw a graph, you can create a space. So here's my word frequency by word pictureability or imageability space, such that all the words on the right of your screen here are words that occur very, very often in the English language during, uh, during con general conversation or the things that we read or write. And those to the left of the screen are things that, while we may be very familiar with them, we don't mention them all that often in speech. And then if you look on the vertical axis, the top things are those things that are easy to picture, and the bottom row are things that it's very difficult to draw a picture of, such as serendipity, which we heard about earlier this afternoon, danger and question. We can't really draw a picture of that. And of course, words don't exist by themselves. They live with other words when we're speaking them, or reading them, or writing them. And we call those collections of words texts. And again, we can uh, derive from texts and measure in texts uh, interesting things which give us an idea about, as I'm going to argue, the mental state or the personality of the people who are using those words. And I'd like you particularly to focus on these three. The predictability of a text, how easy it is to predict what comes next when you're listening to the message that somebody's giving. The richness of the text, in other words, the extent to which the speaker of that text or the writer of that text is using new words all the time or reusing old words that you've heard before in the speech or in the text. And then the key words, which kind of give away what the whole thing or the whole message is all about. So we can draw a, a graph again. It looks slightly different, but here it is. A graph of the key words of this text, which is one of the most famous texts in the English language, the Gettysburg Address. And we can see what the key, that the key words are telling us what, they, what it's about. It's about war, it's about nationhood, it's about dedication, it's about death and people. Uh, and the, uh, the, the density of the key words against the background of the density of all the other words which don't occur all that often uh, gives us an idea of the richness of the vocabulary. So that dense cloud shows us that the speaker of this address uh, had a very, very broad vocabulary. Now, let's contrast each of these features, the frequency and the textual features, of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. Not anyone with Alzheimer's disease. Um, but let's have a look, see, of course, first, what, uh, what happens to frequency and, and, and pictureability. So frequency and pictureability, as Alzheimer's disease progresses, affect the language so that the less pictureable and the lower frequency words drop out of the vocabulary and we're just left with somebody who can talk about pictureable and highly frequent words. And in their texts, in their speech, some of you may have observed this informally in people that you know with this condition, this terrible condition, the, um, the, the, the key words become very frequent and much fewer, and of course the background of, uh, of all the rich uh, additional words that, uh, that come in, the vocabulary, becomes much sparser. <clears throat> 
Now, I'm interested in, but have been interested in one very famous sufferer of Alzheimer's disease, Iris Murdoch, the novelist who wrote um, famous, world famous, celebrated novelist who wrote 39 uh, novels and various works of poetry and uh, uh, drama and philosophy, um, but sadly died in 1999 after a few years of declining mental health or mental integrity, cognitive integrity due to Alzheimer's disease. And when I read Iris's final novel, Jackson's Dilemma, it occurred to me that the language of Jackson's Dilemma was very different from her earlier works, different from that, that hilarious sort of rambustious comedy of her first de debut novel, uh, Under the Net, very difficult, very different from the, from, from the psychological insights of, um, of her 1960s work, uh, The Black Prince, um, hugely different from the mystery of, um, of her Booker Prize winning novel, The Sea, The Sea. So what was it about that, that work that, uh, that g gave rise to its difference? Could it have been the Alzheimer's disease? So I just took the texts, and by the way, before anyone thinks, oh well, um, how can a text reflect somebody's mental state? All they do is sit in front of a computer um, and they can, use, uh, um, they can use dictionaries and they can use thesauruses. Well, that's not the case with Iris. She wrote everything in longhand and she wrote everything sequentially. She, wrote, she bought a pad, she started on page one, she finished on the last page. And what you see on this facsimile of one of her manuscripts is exactly, almost exactly what you see on the printed page of the Penguin edition. So here's what happened to the average word frequency in Iris's novels over, over time. Uh, I've mentioned Under the Net, 1953, and The Sea, The Sea, 1978, but Jackson's Dilemma, we can see the, uh, the, the, the average frequency of the words going right up to the Alzheimer's disease end of the, of the scale. And what happened to her texts? Well, if you think about these, uh, these three lines as representing the growth of the richness of the vocabulary, the two at the top are growing at a rapid rate, whereas the one at the bottom is growing at a much more slow rate and almost suddenly flattening out as the, word pro as the work progresses. So a, a, a loss of richness of Iris's vocabulary. Now the second condition that I'd like to talk about is something called hubris syndrome. And this caught my attention in 2009 uh, when David Owen, or Lord Owen as he became, um, who was Foreign Secretary in uh, James Callaghan's government um, and, a, and was also a neurologist in an earlier life. Um, and uh, his colleague, Ameri an American psychiatrist, Jonathan Davidson, described a very characteristic pattern of personality change in leaders, powerful leaders, heads of government, uh, who'd been in government perhaps for too long uh, and who were beginning to take reckless decisions who were beginning to speak in an unusual way, using the royal we a lot, they said, who were beginning to have contempt for their advisors, not taking any notice of anyone else, just trusting their own decisions, almost trusting their own gut feelings, uh, and showing that um, uh, after this happened, very often things went very, very wrong for them. So think about some of your colleagues at work, maybe your boss, um, who just got a pay rise, or who's just been praised by the head of the department. So hubris syndrome is that guy on steroids. And this was one of the heads of government that Owen and Davidson identified, this US president. But there were two UK prime ministers also in the, uh, in the modern era who also, they thought, qualified for a diagnosis of hubris syndrome. And it was two out of these three. And I'm going to tell you which two those were, but I just want you to think about what you know about their histories uh, and, 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 and decide for yourselves in advance before I tell you the answer. So here's what Owen and Davidson uh, identified in the career of Margaret Thatcher. Here are the red arrows which indicate, well all the arrows indicate events, and the red arrows indicate events where the behavior became in what in, they saw later by looking at the historical record as, as somewhat hubristic. So Margaret Thatcher became slightly hubristic after the successful conclusion of the Falklands War. But then she was restrained, probably by William Whitelaw, who was her deputy and advisor, and the only person really that she listened to. And then after he resigned on health grounds towards the end of her premiership, she became more and more and more hubristic and ex uh, began exhibiting many of these behavioral features. And here's Tony Blair, 
lots of red, much earlier in his premiership, perhaps getting um, uh, overconfident after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, a historic, not, you know, let, let's face it, a, a, a truly historic achievement, um, uh, but then starting to get a, 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 a taste, perhaps, for military intervention, first of all with, uh, with Clinton in, uh, in Yugoslavia, and then uh, on his own in Sierra Leone, both of them very successful, but then more and more and more and more confident until, of course, 2003, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the invasion of Iraq. Now, let's compare that to John Major, who, during his shorter premiership, never showed any evidence, despite having faced a lot of um, and solved a lot of uh, problems. He had to face Black Wednesday when uh, Sterling dropped out of the European exchange rate mechanism. He, um, he, he won a general election victory in his own right. He, um, he, he stepped down and offered himself for re-election against his rebellious colleagues. He was very successful, and yet none of his behavior, none of his language exhibited these signs of uh, hubris syndrome. So let's have again look again at those uh, features that uh, Owen and Davidson described for us. The obsession with self-image, this kind of messianic manner of talking. Uh, they sometimes showed an identification with the nation, seeing that the thinking or um, indicating that the nation's interests and their interests were somehow merged together. As I said, they tended to use the royal we. They had they exhibited this ex excessive confidence in their own abilities and, were, and, and showed contempt for the advice of others. And they were reckless, restless, and impulsive in their decision-making. Now, how does this relate to texts and words? Well, um, those ones that you, I've highlighted in red are quite clearly, or perhaps only in one case clearly, uh, but uh, in the case of the royal we, it's clearly measurable in a text. And what, where, where does the text come from? Well, politicians' words are all measured, uh, are all recorded, and can be measured. They're recorded in this, uh, on the right of this picture, they're recorded in this journal, Hansard, or the official record. And it's not just set-piece speeches, of course, it's spontaneous language that we're recording here. It's the cut and thrust of politics, not the, um, the speech read from an auto cue in front of the party faithful. So I looked at all the... Uh, Prime Minister's Question Time texts in digital format, and I looked for, uh, in all these three uh, Prime Ministers with uh, sufferers from hubris syndrome, uh, and I looked for uses of the, of, of, of the word we uh, in a preference to the word I, and I looked for a measure of recklessness, restlessness, and, and impulsiveness, which I'll come back to in a second. But first, let's look at a tendency to use the royal we in the career of, uh, of Tony Blair. As Owen Davidson said, his hubris syndrome emerged quite early, and so did his increase in the use of his, his, his preference for the use of we over I. It, it, tended, to, um, uh, it tended to die down over time, uh, but there's no doubt that, uh, that the timing of this, this what we call keyness, or what I would like to call we-ness of, um, of his speech, uh, definitely uh, w was coincident with the personality changes described. Now, for restlessness, reckless, and impulsiveness, I turned to um, a concept from information theory, the father of which, of course, is Claude Shannon. Well, I say of course, but I'm telling you, the father of, of, of information theory was, was Claude Shannon. He invented this measure called entropy, which was essentially at the predictability of a message. So a very high, unpredictable message, a very high entropy message, would be one like the one at the top containing a lot of words we'd never heard before and a very low frequency message, a low, very, very low entropy message, would be one which just used the same word over and over again. So if you want to, if you're, you know somebody who has that annoying habit of finishing off your sentences for you, then here's a piece of advice. Get your entropy right up. So here's what happened to Shannon Entropy in Tony Blair's premiership. Again, we see an early rise, uh, similar to the, or coincident with the early rise in hubristic behavior described by Owen and Davidson. Then a drop, perhaps he was advised to temper his, uh, um, his, his behavior and his language, and then an inexorable rise in, uh, until he, he, he resigned in 2007. And here's what happened to, to Margaret Thatcher. A, an early rise, perhaps, with the uh, coincident with her success in the Falklands, 
and then towards the end of her premiership, getting more and more and more and more unpredictable until again she, she resigned or was ejected from office. So I'd just like to finish by saying that I didn't invent any of these ideas. I, I used the ideas that other people have had. And in particular, I'd like to highlight the work of this man, John Burroughs, um, who I met and took his photograph of in his office and department in Newcastle, New South Wales. And he, as a, he was an English graduate and an English postgraduate. And his PhD supervisor said to him, OK, on day one, your thesis is about Jane Austen. So he said, well, what about Jane Austen? And the thesis advisor said, well, I don't know, just Jane Austen. So he took all the books, and he read them, and he read them again, and then he read them again, and he read a few other contemporary novels. And then he started doing something very interesting, which was to look at the occurrence of individual words in the texts of Jane Austen and the texts of her contemporaries. And he found that using these measures, we could actually tell which were the Jane Austen novels and which weren't. And um, he did this without any computers. He just did this using a pen and some record cards. Uh, since then, the, 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 the availability of digital information and digital tools using desktop computers has revolutionized this field. And, I, and some people refer to it now as text mining or data mining. I prefer to refer to it as cognitive archaeology. And we can use it to, uh, to unearth uh, facts about the past, about people, and perhaps even events, using the rich soil, uh, the even ever richer soil of uh, digital text, and the sharpening uh, and ever more powerful uh, tools, excavatory tools of digital computation. Thank you very much. <laughs>